Thank you, Reed. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for having me, by the way. Um, great day for having a, a webinar and, and uh, all of you to learn something. Things have just been uh, pretty dead. A few uh, things moving here today, but uh, for the most part, real quiet day ahead of uh, the Fed announcement. And, of course, things are likely to pick up pretty uh, soon after that happens. And before I get started, just to mention, um, we do have an open house ourselves over at the pristine site um, that's going on where you know uh, our moderators are trading live throughout the day and I'm sure there'll be some trades later today if you log into the site um, you can get free access into that chat room and see what goes on here uh, in the afternoon and I think it's open tomorrow too that being said let's get going here I want to share we call you know some essential concepts that you'll be able to use um, actually starting to today after this is over and um, really for the rest of your life it's a lot of um, what I the basics the foundation um, of what I learned over the years and been using for well well over 25 years now so, well, let me advance this um, Reed did give you a little um, you know background on, on myself um, CEO of pristine founder of the pristine method um, said six times trading challenges over uh, the uh, the Money Show Traders Expos, they still go on today. We haven't attended a little while. They've pretty much quieted down as far as um, a lot of people going. It's, you know, it's kind of interesting how that's been the case in uh, the giant bull market that we've had, but uh, that is what it has been. And, I, you know, like always, probably most people will come charging back in after the market continues to move higher. And, you know, at this point, while we've had a, a bit of a, you know, sharp drop. You know, it does happen during bull markets, and markets actually holding up pretty darn well. Um, and it's pristine. We've been doing this for 21 years, actually. This this month, and we've taught thousands of people. As it says, some some hedge fund managers, market makers. We've had specialists come come to us, and um, believe it or not, you know, most of those guys that are handling huge amounts of money don't have a lot of know-how when it comes to the charts and that's and that's why they come I mean they work off of water flow and that's powerful information uh, but a lot of them don't really have much of an idea about how the technicals work um, equity and prop traders you know we act we actually have a training program for those that want to trade uh, equity prop and Forex uh, prop well, with Forex you can get a lot of leverage with equity the powers to be the regulators and their great wisdom uh, to think that you have to take a test to become a professional trader and, and get the kind of leverage that you can trading uh, commodities and FX uh, but those that want to trade them you know you have to take a test and we help you do that and educate you about the markets and then get you access to uh, a lot of money to trade people have never owned a stock that would that was me probably about 30 years ago they had no idea and went on a, uh, a big you know, search to, to figure this out, which I'll share some of that with you. A lot of our competition have come to us and have built education companies themselves. It's a huge testament to Pristine. Um, you know, a lot of our competition are actually prior students. Um, we've won best trading course over the last uh, several years. Um, you know, that's through votes of people that have that have taken it, and uh, you know, it's the site. That that happens. At tell you the truth, there'll, there'll be a, probably a little shield in there about that as it as it comes up. And as Reed mentioned, I have actually three books um, that I, I've uh, put together. Great information there. Um, you might want to take a look at that. You can lose money doing this. I think you all you all know that. Um, and you know where? It, well, it's, it says that there is a high degree of risk in any type of trading. Risk is something that you can control and should control. You know, money management is a huge part of what we do. Uh, most of you here are looking to learn uh, some concept, some trading strategy, uh, which, of course, you need to, to place a trade or an investment. But risk is about money management, and without that part of it, your odds of success are pretty low. Um, so you can, you know, through, uh, you know, share sizing or contract sizing or different instruments you can control your your risk and a lot of traders actually don't make it in this industry because of 
that exact reason. They don't control risk and they're just focused on the money. Now, I'll just get this little pointer out here again. Um, you know, most active traders, especially intraday traders, use technical analysis to make a trade. Um, certain types can actually hold you back. It held me back um, years ago. You know, I thought that I needed to use, you know, things that were complicated. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and it's really the basics that you need to focus on and what works day in and day out. And you need an understanding what moves prices, you know, especially in intraday. So would a few simple concepts and setups as these, scenar as these scenarios develop, it'll increase your odds of being successful. Now, as long as you have the patience and, and discipline to wait for your setup, uh, what I'm going to show you here today will put the odds overwhelmingly in your favor. Now, the question is, do you need all of these indicators? I, cer I certainly thought so. You know, when I started out many years ago, um, it was like a, a DOS, DOS-based program. DOS being a, that was the operating system at the time. DOS, and I downloaded data over a 2400 baud modem into a 286 computer. I'm not sure what that 286 means. I'm not much of a computer geek, but at the time it was lightning fast. Uh, today it's a paperweight uh, at be at best, and it came with a lot of these types of indicators even way way back then. Today there's a lot there's a lot more. Um, I've used many of them to try and figure out how the markets moved. And I, I came to the conclusion after several years of working with these indicators that they really they don't work or they they just lead to a lot of confusion. Um, you know even even drawing lines on your charts which we'll talk about um, you know, things like an Andrews pitchfork, you know, all of these different analytical tools that attempt to find support and resistance, they're just not necessary. Um, and the percentage of traders that fail, many of it is related to the use of these indicators and um, traders, investors trying to figure out the direction of prices or why prices move up and down through the use of suggest subjective analysis tools. How many beginning traders use it? Well, there's probably any of you that are starting out or when you did start out, I, I would be extremely surprised if you didn't or weren't using the in indicators and went, th went through a process of min using many of them and trying to figure it out. So when I know when I started out, um, well, I read some basic books some of you know with some of them that obviously showed some examples of indicators you know, I thought that it had to be much more complicated than that because that would um, es essentially provide me with a sure thing you know didn't want to lose money um, wanted to be right you know looking for that that holy grail didn't know what that holy grail comment was all about back then because I really didn't know anything and there was no in there was no internet um, you know, so all the information that's available to you guys wasn't available to me back then. Um, you know, but this GAN analysis, this, you know, what they call this the square of nine, um, it's pretty impressive when you start to initially look at it and say, boy, when all this, these things come together at a certain points, you know, prices are going to move in a certain direction. And, um, you know, when you hear about it, you're shown about it, you're shown examples, which is what, um, most of you will see, you know, whosoever is showing you their favorite indicator or their GAN square or their Elliott waves or these Fibonacci retracements and projections, it all looks really convincing. Once you start using it, anybody has to start asking the question, well, why didn't it work here? Why didn't it work there? Uh, why didn't it work the way it was shown to me? Um, and that, and that is where I was many years ago, um, trying to figure out why it didn't work, why it didn't work. Um, where was the consistency in what I was doing? And that light bulb moment didn't come about until I stopped using these things. 
um, and, and projecting time and you know <laughs> it's kind of I laugh as I think about it you know I, as I used these things years ago and tried to you know make sense out of all of it and um, you know even using different levels of Fibonacci extensions uh, levels, projections, all to come about to some point where I, I uh, would assure it to, to make money. And you know, as I said, can you read this? Does this make sense to you? Um, you know, and I, I think eventually, eventually uh, I think most people get confused by it and either, either give up or move on to uh, using something else. And that's what I did. You know, here and so I, you know, I started using what we call the simpler types of technical analysis. You know, you know, have my trend lines and, and Bollinger bands and my stochastics and, and MACDs and used them for a while and you know also used RSI and momentum indicators and what's called a, there's one called the ultimate indicator. That sounds really in, in, impressive. Um, and you know, I put these uh, various indicators on my screen. Um, at some points, there were more indicators squished up there than I could actually even see the prices. And you know, I think, well, if all of these lined up together, of course I'd be assured of a winner and to make a lot of money. Um, didn't work out that way. Uh, it, it, it led to the analysis paralysis um, you know, syndrome that probably most of you have gotten to or, or will get to. Um, you know, because as you look at more and more information, it becomes more and more difficult to make a decision, which is, it's, it's normal. So the, the answer was to start removing these. And you know, I know another one of these reasons why was that, hey, you know, you can change different settings on these. So if it wasn't oversold here, and if the price is pulled back here, you know, they held, but it wasn't oversold. So, you know, my experience was, well, I didn't buy. The indicator didn't tell me to buy. So if I changed the settings and now it was oversold, the next time it would be right and I would be able to get in and take advantage of this nice move that I didn't in the past. Um, drawing lines. Well, sometimes the you know, prices broke through the line. It was meaningful. Other times it didn't. Sometimes it held right on the line. Other times it crashed right through it. Well, I thought, well, maybe I put the lines in the wrong place. Probably many of you have been there. Um, you know, I've often gotten questions or, you know, well, do I draw the lines from the tails? Do I draw it from the closes? Um, you know, our lines, our moving averages actually support and resistance. Well, I'm sure you've all been there. And so here we have a lot of traders. Right? Where do we all start? Well, we want to get rich. Right? The markets are made to make us money, provide us to come together with other individuals that we can exchange our money with, and hopefully we can take more money from them than they take from us. Um, and a lot of the traders have no education. You know, when I started out, I had I had no education. It was just about I'm going to make a fortune here. And um, some of the things I did back in that day was nothing more than, you know, uneducated gambling. Um, you know, to to make huge amounts of money. And sometimes I made lots of money. You know, eventually I took some horrific hits to my account, which led me to saying, you know what? You better learn what you're doing here, or something terrible is going to happen. And luckily, I, you know, I had a substantial amount of money to start with, and I was intelligent enough to say, "Look, you better learn what you're doing here, um, versus, you know, just swinging for the fences." So this is 40% trade for a month. Now, especially if you are starting out like many do today, um, with instruments that have greater amounts of leverage. So those of you that want to trade equities on, on a, a day trading basis, you know you have to have a minimum of $25,000. Unless you become um, one of our prop traders, you know, then you can have a very small amount of money, but you have to take the test. Those of you that want to trade Forex or uh, various E-mini contracts, um, you don't have that restriction and you are allowed to open up an account with a minuscule amount of money. Now it isn't suggested you do that, you should be well capitalized to avoid 
being knocked out of the game within a month, but a lot of people start out that way. They're able to trade those instruments with smaller amount of money, and it's a pretty quick way to um, getting knocked out and, and losing. Now, after that, many just jump from one service to another, one method to another. They never gain confidence in the method that they're using. Those that get past this point, they've narrowed down a style. They're still working on it, uh, you know, making it their own, and that's an important point. You have to make it your own. I don't care where you get your education. You have to internalize it and make it your own so that you could actually teach it if you wanted to, um, but you understand it to a point where you no longer need anyone else's instruction. It's the same thing with any other business. I don't care what, what you're doing. Um, you can't rely on someone else to tell you what to do and how to run your business, and that's how you have to look at what we're doing here is you're running a business. Your odds of success can increase. It doesn't have to take this long, but you have to have a business plan. You know, how are you going to get educated? How, how, you know, how are you going to continue to do this? Um, what's your, your money management plans and so on? What are you going to trade? What time frames are you going to trade? You need to put that all together and, and then gain the experience, you know, education, experience, becoming proficient at what you're doing is the same with everything, not just trading. So how do you do this? What did I do? Well, I removed all of the all of that noise from my screen, and I got back to basics. I said, whatever the news is, news can be a help to guide your focus in a certain direction. However, sometimes news is irrelevant. Stock is going down, for example, over a course of many months, and all of a sudden, you know, downgrade. Right? And and the bottom's out and it starts going up. Right? So you have to match the chart with, with the news. And define your reference points of support and resistance and what and what the trend is. Right? That, that's the key. So it says keep it simple, stupid. And right? we have we want to keep this as basic as we possibly can so that we can make intelligent decisions without getting confused. How are we going to do that? Well, I want I want to determine I want to determine what I call reference points. Right? I want to say where's support? Well, what is support? I want I want to associate anything on my chart with an understanding of what that means, not just not just a word. Uh, so we call that that's an area where there's demand. There's buyers at that reference point of support. And students will often ask me, well, okay, Greg, but how many? Well, in reality, I don't know. Are, or is there enough to actually turn prices around? Well, depending on the trend, well, that, that'll be a good indication. So if it's in an uptrend and it pulls back to support, well, that, that'll put the odds in my favor that there's going to be enough demand. However, if it comes down to support and it's in a downtrend, odds are much lower and odds are that support isn't going to hold and that's what I'm hoping for right? because in a downtrend, I'm going to be looking for shorting opportunities. I'm going to want to sell where there's resistance in a downtrend and where there's supply. That's where others want to sell. And one of the things I tell students is that one of the things, the most simple things that will put the odds in your favor is to never sell short away from resistance. And always sell near some resistance where there's some supply within a downtrend. And that, and that in itself will put the odds in your favor. It won't guarantee a winner, but it'll put the odds overwhelmingly in your favor. Where's it in a sideways trend? So at those points, I, I can buy at support. I can sell at resistance until that stops or trade breakouts. Now, the big epiphany for me was, is there a tradable void? What's a tradable void? Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's where there is no reference point of support and resistance. A gap. Prices gap up, they gap down every day. That creates voids. Momentum moves create voids. If there's nothing to the left, no pivot high, pivot low, no congestion, there's a void. And when that's the case, the odds are very high that prices are going to continue until they close that void. And this, and this is one of the reasons that the idea of being overbought and oversold 
is really a misleading, almost useless concept. Um, any stock or market that is trending down can will continue to trend down until it reaches a point where there's a significant amount of demand, which the majority of the time is going to be where there's some support. So an indicator being oversold doesn't stop prices from going lower. So you want to determine a price pattern that's in alignment with your bias based on support, resistance, and the trend. And the location of these patterns is going to be key. So for example, you could say uh, a bottoming tail, a shooting star, a morning star, whatever the names are, um, those things can be totally meaningless unless they're in alignment with these concepts. So what we want to do is build a thought process for our analysis. Let's go ahead and do that. So we have to have rules right, about that support and resistance. Basic rules. You've probably heard these before. Support and resistance, their levels. However, the ideas of Fibonacci analysis and, and trend lines and Fib extensions and such um, would might lead you to believe that they're exact points, especially when you're looking at things within fractions of a decimal point to draw those lines. You, you think about this through really a, a common sense perspective. It, it, it's really ridiculous to think that, you know, within a fraction of a decimal point, you're going to locate support and resistance. What you need to do is just look to the left of the chart. Basic concept, support once broken, that support becomes resistance and vice versa. So in a sideways move, prices come down to an area. I want to think, I want to be a buyer down there. But were buyers there before, odds are there's going to be buyers there again. As it comes up to an area of resistance, I'm thinking, I want to be a seller. And this is where I want to match those pictures or price patterns in alignment with these reference points. And that'll put the odds in my favor. So when its prices are trending, in this case in, a, in an uptrend, um, what was resistance should become support. This is what we call an area of minor support. I want to be a buyer every time. It's, it's simple and, and that is my focus. If it's in an uptrend, it takes out the high, it pulls back to what was resistance, it's now support, I want to be a buyer. I, I want to line up some picture of buying in, in this area with an expectation that it'll, it can, will continue higher. And we just continue that. That was resistance, but because it's in an uptrend, my assumption is that there's sufficient demand that prices will be able to push through that. And we continue to do the same thing. Now, at some point, that's going to end. That's inevitable. We all know that. Now, the, sm the shorter the time frame we use, right, the greater the odds that it'll end sooner than a longer time frame. Now, when we say what changed here is that, look at the way I drew this. The way prices pushed up through that high, there was strong momentum, which tells me there was strong demand. Even stronger momentum. Now the momentum slows, and, and this is where the indicator-based mythology will say, oh, momentum slowed, there's a divergence. And you got, you know, this way you got the indicator on the bottom here and it's making a lower high. That doesn't change the trend. Momentum can slow down, and it can speed up again, and momentum can slow for various reasons. So we don't short or even think about shorting within an uptrend unless it becomes climactic meaning it's, it's accelerated to the upside uh, with such momentum that the odds have increased dramatically that it's going to pull back. And that's where we get into using multiple time frames. Um, but as it pulls back within an uptrend, even though now it's down what we call major support, the prior swing low that was prior to this new high, this is where I want to be a buyer as well. Even though the, you know, there was slowing momentum and there was a, a deep retracement, so the way to use retracements is just to look at the distance between lows and highs. And if it fell back this far, 
right? That was a deeper retracement. However, it's still in an uptrend. Not until it breaks this low has the trend been violated. It's that, it's that simple. Higher highs and higher lows. Once it doesn't meet that definition, it's no longer in an uptrend. So within that trend, there's going to be corrections. Corrections can be corrections through time. Sideways moves. Now, what does that actually mean? Right? So I, I said, when I talk about support or resistance, I want to know what, what that means. There's demand or there's supply. Well, what does a time correction mean? Well, what that tells me, and here, look, here's the gap up above resistance. That's bullish. But now it's created this concept that I told you about, this void, where there's no support. Well, there's a little support over here, but there's nothing in between here. So within a time correction, that tells me that demand is strong enough. Right? There are enough buyers to stop this from falling back into this gap area here. And those are the kind of breakouts I want to buy. You can see this is an intraday chart. I want to buy these kind of breakouts because this has what I call has created an area of support to launch prices to move up from. If you look at a chart of Twitter yesterday, intraday, you'll see it initially moved up and it went sideways like this and it exploded higher. It's not doing so well today. Uh, last I looked, it's actually kind of come back a little bit off of support. It's pretty interesting. I mean, after that move that it had yesterday. But again, a little time correction. These are powerful within uptrends because they don't pull back to support. They create support. Now, this one pulled back to support, but again, it pulled back and corrected through price. But I still want to be a buyer over here because it's where the buyers are. Well, I spoke about pictures. Now, I don't want to be confused about the dark cloud covers and the haramais and the piercing patterns, the morning stars or evening stars and all of, all of that. All I focus on is these candles and I put together these individual candles. I say, what does this tell me? Oh, it was higher and it came back down. The momentum stall, it was higher and it came back down. Now, is that meaningful? Well, it depends. I've seen these plenty of times where this happens and prices continue to move up. I would imagine some of you have. Have you ever seen this type of pattern? You've maybe read some candlestick book or have been shown a few examples and you see this pattern and then prices are off to the races again and moving higher. You think, well, why does that happen? Well, if it happens within an uptrend, Many times these can be ignored, especially if the price is started out of a base where it broke out. And then you get these topping tails where there's a little profit taking, and it'll stall and then continue to move higher again. A lot of traders lose money because they have a basic knowledge of candles, and you know, they short a picture like this, but it's not within the context of a trend. So remember the basics. Downtrend, what was support? That was support since it held here and moved back up. But because it's in a downtrend, odds are it's going to continue to move lower. So as it's doing that and it comes up to where the supply is, I look for a picture. It could be a picture like this. It could be a picture like this. They mean the same thing. It was going up, and now it's getting knocked back down again. So whatever you call it doesn't matter. Within an uptrend, I'm looking for pictures of buying. Where? At the proper location. I'm looking for it to pull back to where the demand is. Right? There are going to be bids. Those of you looking at a level two, you see the bid side and the offer side. Well, I'm looking for bids. And when it comes down here, and a little side note here, not to get into too much about level two, there's probably not going to be too many bids when it pulls back here. That's okay because there's some uncertainty about the pullback. There was selling here. But then you'll see the bids begin to pick up as it goes higher. Well, something to be aware of. Buyers aren't really ready to jump in there so aggressively until they see some stabilization. And I'm no different than that, meaning as it pulls back, I don't know for sure that it's going to stop at that, at that low. So that's why I look for that picture of buying 
that camel reversal pattern that tells me it's ready to turn. So here's what we want to do. I want to pick a higher time frame. So well, I'm talking to you point of view right now as an intraday trader um, with these time frames. But if I was a, a swing trader or looking for core positions, I'd use weekly and daily time frames to do the exact same thing. So within this uptrend on this 60 minute chart, right, my choice, 60 minute chart, I call that, that that's my road, my guide to where buyers and sellers are going to be. Um, it's not to say that this is the only time frame you could use. And it, 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 it's a choice. There's no magic time frame, but this works for me as an intraday time frame. And now I'm looking for those support points within that 60 minute time frame. And as prices pull back to those support points, I'm going to drop down to my five minute chart, take an x ray. I'm looking for that transition right, from sellers in control to buyers taking control. And one of the questions that often comes up is, well, Greg, the five-minute chart's in a downtrend. Is that okay? Absolutely, because I'm looking for that transition in this higher time frame to continue to move higher. So at this reference point, I'm then looking for a picture. I know it doesn't look exactly like what I showed you, but this is trading real for real. The picture's set up in different ways on different days. I right? just think about today, what's going on. Um, but common sense and the type of analysis I'm telling you about will get you ready to take advantage of the next move. Because this is what should happen in, the, in this area. And as prices pull back, we do the same thing again. Buyers are taking control, bottoming tail, retest. That little bottoming tail right there. I love when they take out a couple of lows and spring back up again. That is almost a sure sign that prices are ready to go higher. Right? And when you get that little shakeout down there where it takes out some stops and then it pops right back up again because it tells me that there's strong demand or bids under current prices. I don't need indicators, bands, waves. They confuse me. That you know, that's for me that's confusion and the thousands of people that we've taught and I've taught, you know, the light bulb moment goes on when they start removing all of this noise from their charts and it's, they start to make sense. And they understand why prices are moving the way they are. Now here's an example. So prices fell all the way back down to the low. But this is where the buyers are. So do I think this is going back up to the high? Not very likely. It's not, it's not likely to go up the way it did here. Now, as it comes down here, I know that there's going to be buyers here. And like I said before, I don't know how much. But my bias is at that point, it's going to bounce. Maybe it's going to go to $80. I'm, I mean, that gives me an initial target. It could go back up to 81. It might go to 82. I've seen that kind of price movement before, and I probably you have too. Things can move in a ways that um, don't seem to make sense right? based on what we're looking at. Um, that's always going to probably be the case. We, we, you know, our methods or strategies aren't always going to be, um, you know, telling us exactly what's going to happen. But at these inflection points. I know the odds are this is where buyers are going to show up. So I'm looking at my smaller time frame. I'm looking for a picture. As prices are moving down, it pops back up. Now this has created a little reference point of support on my five minute chart. I want to be a buyer down here. I don't want to be a buyer here. So some, for some traders, this is where they want to be buyers because they look for it to take out this swing high. It can work. Right. It works with the proper money management, especially if, if they're lined up with this larger time frame. It, it can work, but I want to get in here because it raises my reward to risk in a huge way getting in here. And because trades don't always work, right? well, I'm close to where my stop point will be. Whereas those that would enter here, right, they still got to use the same stop. 
or they should use, but some of them use just a money stop, which is better than no stop. Um, but the markets don't care that you're only willing to lose $100 or $300 or $500. Um, prices could pull back. You could be stopped out for your few hundred dollars, um, and then it's back off to the races. Some of you may have experienced that. So when do you trade against the trend? Remember I said when it's climactic. What does that mean? Well, as prices are trending, there's always that hesitancy about prices being able to continue to move higher. That's you know that adage of um, climbing the wall of worry. So as prices move up and traders like, oh, I better take my profits, and it pulls back, <coughs> and buyers say, oh, it's cheap, let me buy it you know, as, as it pulls back again. Oh, let me get it cheap on the pullback. Let me get it cheap on the pullback. And it's like, wow, this stock or this market is really strong. Buyers become more aggressive. It doesn't pull back that far anymore. Well, I didn't get it here. I didn't get it here. I didn't get it when and up here. Well, I better jump in here because this thing is really strong. And this is where traders are so convinced that it's going up, they're willing to pay any price. And this is where it becomes climactic. And we view that through an acceleration in prices where prices move far away from the reference points where buyers are going to be. And when I said there are buyers at support, well, if prices move with this kind of momentum, there's no support. They're going to want to buy here. So if you chase and buy it up here, well, you're going to need a huge stop. And you've missed the move where the, you had the, the great places to enter. And most of the time, these trends end right at this prior resistance. So why did anybody buy up here? Because it's been proven right, that it's been going up. Some of you may have pressed the button right here at this high, or if this was going down, you sold your long position right as it accelerated to the downside, as it moved into support. Been there, done that. Right. Honestly, I've done it. And this, is, and this is why charts speak to me. As I see, when I see this happening, because I become emotionally attached to some of these patterns from my past, and I recognize what novices are doing. Now, what I want to do is it comes up here, and I know the novices have gotten caught, is drill down again to my smaller time frame and look for that change in trend. Here's the break, and I short right here. There are many other patterns that we could use. Um, as well, like an, like an M top, some of you may hear head and shoulders tops. Anyway, they're distribution patterns, and the location of that pattern is key to it actually following through as it suggests. Okay, guys, we're doing good here on time. And I'm willing, we'll take some questions. I'm almost done here. If you have questions, I don't, honestly, I can't see them. But if you do, um, so what we want to do is higher time frame. In this case, I'm, I'm using a daily time frame. Uh, this one, two, three setup is, is a setup that we teach in our TPM class, uh, which you know is a momentum bar moving up, wide range bar, uh, a resting bar, and then a continuation pattern. So this is one of the times that we will enter a position where it's away from support, but the move has just begun. It's ignited a move. Whereas that same pattern up here, you couldn't you couldn't get me to do it. Um, but as it moves up here, I know that there's going to be sellers. This is where the resistance is. So I'm going to use this as my bias for the next trading day. I'm I'm waiting. I know the sellers are going to show up here. I want I want to see a pattern that's in alignment with that bias. So well, here it is. And this was an actual trade that I did. This is from some time ago, but this was my analysis. I'm looking for prices to pull back here. And when I look inside this candle, right? Remember, this was the daily chart. I'm looking inside this candle here. And as prices accelerated higher, you see the way this has moved up. This is creating this void underneath. 
Now, inside this daily bar, it can happen in different ways. And it could have went sideways, could have went sideways at the beginning of the day and accelerated, or it could have accelerated to the upside and went sideways, which is what happened. Here's the intraday chart. It went sideways at the end of the day, which forms a consolidation, a base. Traders buy breakouts. A lot of traders don't take into consideration multiple time frames. So those that bought the breakout at the worst possible time, based on the daily chart, got caught on the failed breakout. Like I said, I've been there, done that. I know what this means. They're going to sell. And as it starts to break down, I'm selling it short here with a stop up here going to what I call intelligent hope mode. I just hope this thing drops really hard. And then I manage it according to my, my money management rules and position management rules. So this will put the odds usually, hugely in your favor by putting together like these basic concepts, support, resistance, trend, multiple time frames, and then the candlestick patterns in the right location. Hey, Greg, just want to give you a heads up. you got about two minutes remaining. No problem, Reed. I'm on my last slide here. So this is how you're going to put the odds in your favor. To find the trend in multiple time frames, use a higher one. That's going to be your bias. You will define where the trend is, support, resistance, and use a lower one for your entry. There's no perfect time frame. It's it's a choice. Right? This is an or type of chart. Line, you know, you use a bar chart or a candlestick chart. That's a choice you have to make. You look at too much information, you're going to get confused. It's an, it's inevitable. Um, so what we want to do is support, resistance, the lack thereof, the void, relative strength and weakness. Well, Market's moving down, stock won't go down or vice versa. That's great information. What's the broader markets doing? A and sector analysis. Look at your market internals, breadth and sentiment internals. Right? Money and trade management. This is what puts together a trading plan. This is what Christine does, is teach you this and help you put it together. Um, in the class, after the class, there's continuous coaching uh, that happens every day. Midday, you go into what's called a grad room. On Tuesdays, after the market closes, um, you come into a coaching room and, and, we, and we review trades, what's happened in the markets, look at stocks of interest, and, and so on. Um, and we do uh, workshops, what we call aftermarket lessons, is actually one today, which you can go to the site and sign up for. Um, as I said, there's an open house. And what I offer you today is to come to Pristine, uh, come into that open house, come into those aftermarket lessons and see if what we do makes sense to you. And if it does, give a counselor a call um, and see what we can do to help you um, get to where you want to be in the markets and 